I read an article once that if a man breaks wind in Hounslow, it can affect a hurricane in Java. I don't think I know the man they're talking about. Travels on the circle line. Welcome to episode 11 of the Jonathan Creek podcast, where I certainly think I know the man they're talking about, and he doesn't travel on the circle line, he travels on the, the bus into Glasgow. I'm looking <laughs> at him. No. Why did he bring his photo everywhere? Good episode this week. I enjoyed it. Mother Red Cap. How are you, Ian? I'm not too bad, Jerry. How are you? Yeah, I'm okay. You enjoying the Scottish summer? No. <laughs> no. Yeah, decent episode. Some contrivances, but it's okay. Yes, there is uh, one major contrivance, but some nice clues. Yeah. Some nice logic. I liked it. Nice bit of humour as well. I like it when the humour is at the, the right level, it's the right notes, it's good. Mm-hmm. It's not a, a nasty humour. Yeah, it's not cruel and it's not. It's also not jarring, it's not taking you out of the story. Mm-hmm. Did we mention the title this week? You haven't. Oh, did you? I can't remember. No, maybe you did. Mother of Red Cap. Just in case we didn't. It's a good title. I've got some trivia about that later on. So have I. That might be the same trivia. Probably. <laughs> you, can, you can go for it. <laughs> I'll save it for an appropriate moment. Okay. The end. Well, when we see Mother Redcap, I think. No, at the end. Why at the end? Because that's where we do trivia. Okay. We're boring everybody. There's only one way to resolve that. Fast forward. <laughs> to stop the podcast. And <laughs> do something else with your life. What was that TV, kids TV show? Why don't you? Mm, yes. We're rambling now, Ian. You say now as if we don't do this at the start of every podcast. Summary? Yes, let's just do that and then we can get into it. Crack on. In Mother Redcap, Jonathan and Maddie have separate mysteries to keep them busy, as one investigates the murder of a judge, while the other learns more about a mysterious string of identical deaths from 50 years ago. When the two cases turn out to be more closely related than seemed likely, Jonathan starts to put the pieces together. But can he figure this one out, or is he in for a shock? Nice summary. Cap doffed. Red cap. No. Okay. What are you talking about? We begin watching television. We do. Watching television in Judge Sweetland's house. What type of TV show is it? Well, it's the type of TV show that doesn't exist. It's half news report and half threat from Chinese assassins to the judge. It is there merely to provide some background exposition. Yes. We discover that Forrest Sweetland, a High Court judge, is under house protection before a high-profile trial against these uh, Chinese gangsters. The Bamboo Mafia. I'm not sure how racist or not that moniker is. Yeah. The place is full of cops and we see Detective Inspector Ken Speed arrive and pass around pictures of potential assassins and their methods to those charged with protecting the judge. I had some issues with this. Okay. First one, it's fine, it's a joke about the invisible man doesn't have bandages around him like that's that's quite a classic reference. Mm -hmm. Not everyone's gonna get that, but it's fine. Second one is a martial arts type. Mm. What are these CID guys gonna do about that? They don't really look equipped to deal with anyone who knows any kind of martial arts. Do they have guns? I mean, we see, I think outside there's armed cops. Yeah. So perhaps you just shout on the armed cops and they charge in. It's also quite vague martial arts type. Was he some kind of karate expert? Taekwondo? Feng Shui. Does he just do judo? Is he going to roll them over? Tai Chi. Pin them down? Yeah, who knows? Feng Shui. Mm, that's what I said. Yeah, I'm agreeing. Did I say Feng or Feng? I think it doesn't matter. Okay, yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> The third one, though, I don't get this. They say he's a suicide bomber, but how many times has he done that? <laughs> <laughs> a known, su- a, a habitual suicide bomber. Every month he's out there suicide bombing. Yeah, he's not a cry for help. Yes. Sweetland's off with his wife for an early night. Yes, Gwyneth. So Speed tells the other cops to do a, a final sweep of the bedroom before they retire. I notice that the, the Sweetlands have separate beds in their bedroom. This a uh, a traditional thing, the ones that you maybe push together at times of requirement. Yeah, I think it's a yeah a more traditional relationship. I think especially when you get to a certain age. Uh huh. I've seen it before where couples are more comfortable just having their own bed, right? And they don't have any real need to be 
physically closer than that. Right. I, just, not, I assumed that he was incontinent and she just didn't like it. Well, that, that could be, it. that's what I'm talking about, yeah. Potentially, it might be that there are issues or people just like their space. Yeah. Uh, and the relationship's developed to, now we should say, we're not being ageist. There's plenty uh, of more mature people who like a good bit of uh, rogering. I've heard. But not all. Some prefer they've given up on that malarkey and just want a good night's sleep. Don't want to wake up in a, a puddle of their partner's urine or feces. During the night, Judge Sweetland is seen muttering as the clock ticks to 3.46am and we, we tick through to, to morning. We should say that we see the sweep being carried out. Very, It looks very diligent. There's gadgets and there's dogs inside and out. And we also see that there, these armed cops are in the garden. Yeah, I mean, for all that the, the group of CID folks look like, you know, rejects from a Harry Potter movie, it was still a fairly professional operation. Gwyneth, the wife, she seems far more concerned. I think the judge is doing a crossword or Sudoku or something like that in, in bed. I think maybe he just trusts the protection. Mm -hmm. Either he's trying to put on a brave face for his wife's benefit. And outside the bedroom door itself, there are two cops, a male and a female. They're guarding. Yes. We cut to 3.46 in the morning. Did you mention the time? Yeah, he was mumbling and muttering and then the next thing we know it's morning. Yeah. Before we get to the morning, I'll briefly mention Leonard Kavanagh who played the judge of Sweetland because we don't see him again. Okay. Jonathan Creek was his last appearance on screen. He gets stabbed in the heart. Method but, acting is it's unfortunate, but these things happen. He was also in London's Burning, Sorry, The Bill, Blake's Seven, Z Cars and Upstairs, Downstairs. Decent resume. It's all right. So it's dawn next morning. The CID fellows come along with some coffees and they hear a crash from the bedroom as the, the clock ticks across to 6am. Correct. So they rush in. The female cop goes over to the judge who has fallen from his bed and when she stands back she finds blood on her hands and he's obviously dead. Clearly. Speed is on the scene a little bit later and there is a pathologist there. She tells him what she knows. I'm sorry, Ken. I can do you what and where, but... How's going to take a better brain than mine? It appears to have gone pretty much through the centre of the heart. Wounds barely a millimetre in diameter. As if it had been stabbed by... I don't know... A rapier or something? How about when? Well, if you're saying they heard it happen at six o'clock... Any earlier, you wouldn't have seen this carpet for blood. <sighs> Barred windows, solid walls, nothing that comes close to a murder weapon. What the hell are we looking at here? Hello. Who's been cutting their nails? If they have, it was a very blunt pair of scissors. This looks as if it's been ripped off someone's finger. This actually, the the injury, brought to mind, I don't know if you've seen it, the modern Sherlock adaptations. Mm -hmm. The guy who got stabbed but then bled out in a locked room. Because yeah. the wound didn't affect him until a little bit later on. Mm. But I don't think it's that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it just brought it to mind, it just reminded me of that. The same sort of death, like a wound with no obvious means of applying it. Sure. It's a disgusting toenail that they found. Fingernail. Even worse. Yeah. No, it's not worse. Toenail's worse than a fingernail. Yeah, but that particular fingernail. Yeah. If that was a finger, oof. Over to Maddie's flat. She is moaning to Jonathan that she has had little in the way of work. And he laughs as he reads a letter to her from someone wishing to team up on a project about... The Mother Red Cap pub. Yes, a London hostelry. Mm -hmm. She's not that interested. He's basically taking the mic over for this. Her phone goes. And he, yet again, answers her phone, yeah. To who? It's the guy who wrote the letter. Mr Tippett. And rather than say she's um, died in a fire or something, he puts her on the line. So she starts the conversation aggressively, but appears immediately smitten before we cut to Tippett sitting at home <laughs> in a unique fashion. Can you tell us about this? Well, he's sitting there in the nude smoking a pipe, but... I think we've mentioned this before. It's risky business. Very risky business. What about the ash? Whoa. Whoa. 
Yeah, and it's not like a, it's not just like a little bit of ash from a cigarette. Yeah. It's like burning embers. If that tips, you're, it's a hole. Right on the thigh. If you're lucky. Mm. They make an appointment to meet. That night, that is really dodgy. There's no way anyone these days would be doing that. A stranger phones you up. Yeah. It could be anyone. I'll meet tonight. Yeah, it's... At like this abandoned spooky pub. Yeah, you wouldn't do that. Mm. Or you would bring someone else with you, I think. I don't know if oh, she yeah. hasn't asked Jonathan to go along. Yeah, or you would at least make sure that folk knew where you were. Yeah, so anyway, they're agreeing to meet to investigate his 50-year-old mystery. And you can see that Jonathan is jealous, but he's also, he looks correctly concerned. Yeah, but Maddie's oblivious to this, she's off for a bath. And as she pops upstairs, the door goes. And when he, when Jonathan opens it, he confirms his name, what happens? Well, that's for a start. Why would they expect him to be at her house? That's a very good question. Yeah, because he they would have went to his uh, windmill. He's not there. Mm -hmm. Perhaps if they went to Adam, and then she, he might have said, "Well, he's either at his windmill or he might be at Maddie's." Maddie's. Or we learn later it was Doctor Strange who's the connection. So maybe his wife, who's the family friend of Jonathan, said he might be with Maddie. Yeah. Let's assume that it fits the story. Okay. So what happens? <laughs> These men who appeared to they don't identify themselves as police, I don't think, do they? No. They, they haul him out the, the house. Yeah, he's huckled. Yeah. And when Maddie comes down, she assumes he's stormed off and off. Mm hmm So she's quite pleased. And also annoyed, I think. Like, she's pleased he's not mm. there, but she's annoyed. Oh, she's pleased that he's wound up by the fact she has a date. Yeah, she likes to think that he is jealous. Yeah. But also a bit miffed that he's just going off without saying anything, I think. We fast forward to the restaurant. Yes, so they're not meeting at the no. abandoned pub initially. A now clothed tippet and a clearly still smitten Maddie are eating some food as he briefs her on the Mother Red Cap mystery. Can you tell us a little bit about what we find out here? Well, he talks about the death of William Ambergast in 1969 and that since then, I think he works in real estate and he says that the the property's been poison on the market ever since because of these seven men that were literally terrified to death in an unexplained fashion. Yeah, we see flashbacks to these mysterious deaths and there's something at the window. It's all a bit unexplained. Yeah, we get, yes, it's a visual representation of what he's telling Maddie. We're not actually at the pub, but you see this creepy mother red cap saying, this is when I was going to drop in my trivia, but we'll save it for the end if you prefer. Yeah, but what I'll do is I'll mention uh, Mr. Tippett just now. Okay. He was played by Marcus Gilbert, born in 1958. He has been in some fairly large Hollywood movies. Army of Darkness, Rambo 3, Riders, also in Doctors, Murders She Wrote, 1989 Doctor Who episode, and he's made over 50 commercials. I think he's very much into uh, mountaineering now and makes some... Uh, documentaries or movies uh, in that field. There you go, that sounds like a good career. The first story that Tippett tells Maddie about the, the men is uh, Clifford Jennings. He's obviously hired a prostitute and taken her up to a special room that was kept for visitors to the pub. Obviously. And at midnight, preparing for his bed, he looked out the window and died. Hmm. Just keeled over. Heart attack, I have assumed. The woman's convinced he's seen something utterly horrible, setting off a fatal seizure. Reflection. That's possible, isn't it? Mm. But between 47 and 51, there were... He says five more, but I think there must be six more if there were seven in total. What's a, what's a number? A number of deaths between friends. So there's, yeah, a number of similar deaths in similar circumstances. Mm. From the restaurant, we head to the a police station where Jonathan is rubbing his arm after the harsh treatment at the hands of, we now discover, were two detectives. Yeah, Speed apologises for not making clear to them that um, it wasn't a suspect they were bringing <laughs> He then mentions the House of Monkey case, which you yes. referenced earlier, and he says that he thinks Jonathan could help with the Sweetland case before asking Jonathan to touch his swollen lump. On his armpit? Yeah. It's really inappropriate. Is this some sort of strategy or is it just that he's really weird no he has um what would be classed back then as hypochondria 
Right. These days it's called uh, health anxiety. You don't use the term hypochondria. Or you don't call people hypochondriacs as much as not as they seem to be as understanding or sympathetic. Okay, so he's a hypochondriac. He's a hypochondriac. And yes, he thinks he's got a lump on his arm. Yeah, I'm sure he's got, every day he's got a lump somewhere. I can guarantee it will not bother him in the future. No, he's a fine figure of health. <laughs> anyway, while, while they're talking, WPC Radner comes in with some refreshments and yeah. she and Jonathan share a wee moment. Yeah, there are a few things, again, that um, I was going to say date the show, but perhaps it's just dating the inspector. Uh, perhaps even yourself there, Ian. I'm not sure. I could be wrong, but I don't think uh, you would call a female cop a WPC anymore. I think they're, everyone's a PC. But you would then. You would then, yeah. I mean, the fact that she enters with T. Yeah, I mean, that's weird. Yeah, acting like a secretary. Assistant, yeah. And Speed co thanks her and calls her sweetheart. Oh, better than calling her sweet bread. Mm -hmm. Sweet cheeks. Yeah, sweet land. Mm -hmm. You get mixed up. Sweetie pie. Yeah. Toots. Half expecting a little pat on the, the backside as she left. I think that was off camera. No doubt. In any case, she's introduced to Jonathan and it appears that there is some sort of attraction there. Now, we, we learn her name is uh, Faye or Radner. I said Radner. Yeah. Did you? WPC Radner, that's what I said. You did, yes. Her first name's not important, she's a female police officer. There was a, a report, I think, fairly recently, by the time this comes out, it'll be a month or two ago, um, Andrew Neil is leaving Sunday Politics, the main politics show in the BBC, on a mm -hmm. Sunday morning. The report was Andrew Neil to be replaced by a female presenter. <laughs> <laughs> Who yeah. has a name? It's Sarah Smith, but <laughs> they just said female presenter. It's the same idea, it's not going away. No. We skip over to... Maddie and Tippett at Mother Redcap. Now it's not a flashback any longer. It's become a haven for vagrants and the lock has been forced open. Yes, yeah, a derelict building. And she provides her own jump scare. Yeah, she pretends to scream as she looks out the, the window that killed the men and gets a fright of her own when she turns around and Tippett's not there. No. He dramatically reappears. That's a bit of a you know, it's a bit of an arsey thing to do. You have to hide in a corner. Yeah, and it's fine. If it was me and you, I would do that. Yeah. But he is trying to persuade her to work with him on this case. You know, he's looking for something here. Yeah. And it's not like he's also done this before she did her scream. So mm -hmm. it's not like he's responding to her trying to take the, the yeah. make of him. It's an odd way of doing things, yeah. I think he's a strange man. I think he is a strange man, yeah. They fix his torch and they happen to be sitting right next to a dead body now. Did they not smell there was something? Maybe the whole building smells so bad. I'd imagine the whole place stinks of uh, urine. Okay. And feces. You've got a thing about urine and feces today. Can I? Yeah. yeah. We get a, a quick flick over to Jonathan with uh, speed where he's shown this fingernail. Yeah, and the chemistry appears to be growing between Jonathan and Radner. Yeah, there's uh, additional facial expressions beyond just the, the smile. Mm-hmm. They're pondering why an assassin would allow his nails to grow to such a, a length, but that's not really a question. I mean, some people, it's odd, that, uh, I don't like it, but you know, there are some people who wear their nails long. Yeah, they get them manicured and whatever else. Yeah, maybe they play the guitar. Maybe, they just save them money on plectrums. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we see Maddie in the station after reporting the death. She's in a separate area. And we get this sort of, it's becoming a creek trope. In fact, I think we can say it certainly is a creek trope of a conversation where one party isn't listening. Mm -hmm. It's not even the first time it's happened in this episode. But Tippett's talking to her, he's, you know, he's enjoyed his evening with her. He wants to tell her more about his lifestyle. He's a nudist and is that okay with her? She doesn't hear a word he says and says, that's wonderful. And he thinks it's amazing. She's happy with this. He gives her a big kiss and then... <laughs> He leaves. In fairness, there's a consistency there. This does happen. And also, it sets up some nice comedy yeah. later in the episode. Now, at this point, we find out that, and I, I didn't like this term as well, look, it was just some old bag lady. Nothing more sinister. Yeah, but some old bag lady. So it was a, it's a person. It's a person, yeah. It wasn't just some old bag lady. Oh, well, she's dead. That's fine. Who cares? Fortunately, we find out more about her later, but mm. what if it had just been somebody who was just a homeless old lady who didn't have a backstory? Yeah. She still would have been important to somebody. Did you mention there that they arranged to meet? Uh, I didn't. Uh, I think it was part of the whole conversation that was one-sided. But yes, mm. there's an arrangement made that they will... And they separate with a kiss. Yeah, and yes. He gives her a big kiss and mm -hmm. she reciprocates. Mm. 
After Tippett leaves, Maddie's curiosity takes over and she's trying to listen into the interview room and she's yeah. caught by... I mean, I don't think I really made it clear. The reason that she's distracted from this conversation is that she sees Jonathan in the interview room. Yes. So now Tippett's gone, she can concentrate on working out what the heck Jonathan's doing there. Mm -hmm. But she's approached by Radnor. She is. And how does she... What's her cover here? She pretends to be Jonathan's wife. Uh-huh. That doesn't really cover her. Why would his wife have wandered into the police station? Well, she wouldn't know. Perhaps someone else who was in the house, a child might have said, Dad's away to the police station. But I don't think they just let you into the back of the police station where all the interview rooms are. It's normally a reception. Yeah, but Radnor would not be aware of who has let her in. Yeah, she might have been brought through, yeah. yeah. Okay, Radnor's face clearly falls when she learns that Jonathan is married. Yeah, and inside the room, Jonathan himself is highlighting why he is not keen on helping. If he does so, he may be the next person on the tongs death list. And that's a, a decent point. Yeah, why would he get involved? Yeah, you've got a high court judge surrounded by numerous cops and some have got machine guns and yet still... Killed in his own bed. Yeah, so why did, why would Jonathan assume that he can be protected? Exactly, but Speed's not interested. He says he's going to pick him up at 10 tomorrow and now when Jonathan smiles at Radnor, he gets a grimace rather than a reciprocated smile. And we see Maddie standing in the doorway before she pulls him out like a naughty schoolboy trying to keep up this matrimonial guise. Mm. Where are we next? We're in a car. Oh, it's, this is good. Yeah. With Speed. Driving mm. at Speed. Speed by name. Speed by nature. Talking mm. about his heart condition and stress levels and the fact that doing anything too exciting could cause him to just die. Jonathan is terrified. He shows, Speed goes on to show himself as a, a man of the dark ages by complaining about the fact his daughter is gay and having a, a baby by donation of yeah. sperm. I don't know if you missed it, but we got our obligatory POV shot. I didn't catch that in my notes, so I maybe didn't spot it. Was it from the window of the car? Yeah. Uh, I think I did see it, I just didn't. Yeah. yeah. Jonathan's clearly not impressed by this. We've seen in the past, Jonathan's not a bold passenger, he's not a brave man when other folk are driving, is he? No, I mean, he doesn't drive himself. No, but he's always buckled in and looking nervous. Yeah, he's not. He doesn't like Maddie's driving. No. They're going to the Sweetland home, obviously. Yeah, but before they get there, there's almost a collision. Yeah, somebody quite normally pulls out of a, a drive, or no, a junction, mm -hmm. and Speed is going so fast he has to swerve to avoid them and blames them. Yeah, I suppose they should probably have looked, but it's probably one of those junctions, you get, it's a high wall, you can't see far enough, and yeah, he's and going at such a speed. Yeah. Yeah, there's plenty of blame to go around. Did you like Speed? I did like Speed. Did you recognise him? I thought he looked familiar, but he seemed maybe he's one of those guys that's in a lot of things. I certainly recognised him. I like some of his earlier work. He was played by Brian Murphy, born in 1932. Most famous for playing George and George and Mildred. Okay. And more recently been in some of the later seasons of Last of the Summer Wayne. On top of that... You would have seen him in Man About the House, The Devils, Casualty, The Booze Cruise, and Lame Ducks. You would also have seen him in One Foot in the Grave. David Rennick cast him in that and killed him off in that as well. So I presume he's got something in for him because we're going to find out <laughs> some, some issues with him later on in this episode. We get to the Sweetland House and in the bedroom, Jonathan finds out more about the mystery from Speed and the widow Sweetland before something new piques his interest. Sorry, just to fix it. He'd half fallen out of bed, about here, with a load of stuff from his table on the floor. If I remember from the photo, his clock, a glass of water, some papers and a table lamp. His clock? Well, there's another weird thing, the fact that when I... Except that I obviously was dreaming. Dreaming, Mrs. Wheeler? It's all the worry of that night. It took me a while to drop off, and when I did, I kept waking. The first time, I remember quite clearly, I happened to open my eyes, and the clock there by his bedside said 5.10. I nodded off. I must have woken up again a while later, and this time you, you think I'm mad. It said 4.06. At the time, I swear it was real, but then... How could it have been? Oh, why are we all standing around pretending? There are only two explanations for my husband's death. Either somehow he did it himself or I'm lying. 
because I was the only person in the room. I'm the only one who could possibly have killed him. Well, there we have a confession. That's it. Case closed. However, Jonathan states that she is a suspect only if they fall into the trap they were meant to. That he doesn't know much about nor have an alternative to. Mm. He says there's a third explanation, but he's not within a mile of seeing it. That might also mean that there's not a third explanation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's like, yeah, no, def definitely not her. I can say that for certain, but um, no, I have no other ideas <laughs> now. <laughs> From the Sweetland house, we head to the morgue and a double denim Maddie tries unsuccessfully to blackmail the pathologist into revealing the cause of death. Yeah, she's got some photographs which her husband might be interested to see, but the pathologist is not really perturbed. She takes them off her too easily and finds out they're just football photographs. Yeah, again a little bit unethical. Yeah, immoral. Let's assume she falls for that and says, oh, okay. I mean, you've now created a, a dynamic in the relationship. You're worried for the rest of your marriage that there's someone out there who might know something that you're trying to... Yeah. It's just quite a nasty thing to do. Yeah, very mean. But perhaps Maddie meant to be exposed because she ends up with the fight on her hands anyway. Yeah, I think that was a, a, a lucky coincidence. A little bit you of think? chance. Oh, yeah. Because she wouldn't have known where... Firstly, you don't know that that file is the one... Yeah, that you're sitting on top of it. Uh, it it yeah. was uh, the, the pathologist who placed the file on top of that. If she'd placed it anywhere else, it would have been of no use. Something in that file is shocking to Maddie. We don't know what. Yeah, she leaves that room and we see her opening the file in the, the corridor. And we see the, the response to it. Yeah, over at the Sweetland home, both Jonathan and Sweet come off phone calls simultaneously. And are very quickly at the morgue. And we see the body of the deceased homeless woman and the nail on her hand happens to fit the torn nail found in the Sweetland bedroom. It looks horrifically painful. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine your nail coming off like that? Yeah, but she was probably drunk at the time on meths provided by Jonathan. Yeah. Before we leave the morgue, the pathologist was played by Barbara Horn. She has been in Little Britain, Jam in Jerusalem, Taggart, 2.4 Children, The Bill, Castles, Bergerac, Casualty, and we will either have discussed her or will discuss her shortly. She played a part in Amy and Amiability from Black Hadder Part 3. I've heard of that show. Hmm. Does anyone do a podcast about that? If not, they should. The Black Adder Podcast, that's what I would call it. Folk, go out and find out and let us know, is there a podcast called The Black Adder Podcast? It'd be good to hear about that. Back to Maddie's home. Indeed. We heard a clip at the top of the show. I think what she's trying to explain is the butterfly effect. Correct. But she doesn't really get her, her brain right the way around it. No, as Jonathan emerges from the toilet and asks Maddie if she told the female cop that they were married. She denies it strongly. Indignantly. Yes. Twice. Yes. Like Judas. No, it wasn't Judas. Doubting Thomas. No, it was um, Peter that denied three times. Was it? Yeah. One of them. Hmm. <laughs> anyway. Yes. <laughs> Maddie also has uh, shrunk her top in the tumble dryer. Yes. Jonathan is more capable around the home, isn't he? He's, he knows, you know, he's a better cook, seems a better like, uh, keeping house. Maddie has a theory about the bag lady. Yeah, she goes off on a typical nonsensical explanation involving what? Well, the bag lady was the murderer, but then she was knocked off by the gang to protect their secrets. Yeah, apparently yeah, she was a paid hit woman for the tongs. <laughs> it's preposterous. Yes. Jonathan's not even really interested. No, I think he points out, however, a myriad of reasons why this is... Yeah, well, this was interesting because you mentioned at the top of the show he talked about Doctor Strange from the House of Monkeys and he now talks about astral projection which mm. is what the Marvel character Doctor Strange can do oh, so no, I, I'm uh... assuming that's deliberate when you project your astral form into mm -hmm. another location mm. that's one of his skills okay yeah there's a million holes though in the theory even beyond that one but he then looks interested in the leaflet about the Mother Red Cat pub that's been lying around as Maddie calls Tippett and arranges to pop round to his place for some coffee. Yeah, Jonathan somehow, with a bit of Columbo magic, I think, has figured out that the Sweetland death might fit in with these seven deaths from Mother Redcap. Yes, this connection, this initial connection doesn't... Well, this, this isn't the initial connection, is it? 
because he must have known that the body. There are, okay, yeah, he's got the fingernail connection. Yes, so there is a connection here between two, yeah. the two cases, but still, there's no reason for him to think that the fingernail, the lady, or any of this has to do with something from fifty years previous, other than that it was in the building. Yeah, he's also pondering the clock at this point, and starting to wonder why the stuff was knocked off the table if the wound looks like it was delivered without any resistance. So these are two things that are marbles rolling around in his mind. So mm -hmm. he wants more details. He wants Mary to grill trip it. Trip it? Tip it. Tip it. And the next time she meets him for all the information she can get about these deaths. Yes, he believes that it holds the key to the Sweetland murder, but has nothing to do with a fingernail. Yes, but he's no good reason to believe that. No, as you mentioned, Columbo magic. Yeah. So we're at the Tippet homestead. A cheery Maddie knocks on his door and we see her eyes drop downwards as she's greeted and welcomed into his home where apparently everyone there are keen to meet her in the flesh. I like that turn of phrase. Yeah. Well, it was, it's good we find out later they don't force her to participate in their hobby. No, that would be... Sexual assault, really. Yeah, but it's the kind of thing where, for humour, some shows might have gone along that those lines and had her participate. Mm. Probably in her contract that she didn't have to do that sort of thing. No doubt. Back at the windmill, Jonathan is there and he's got his new lady friend, Radnor. Yeah, they're out, yes, they are out on the sort of balcony area off the, the windmill having a romantic meal. Yes, and she's enjoying her meal and enjoying the, the conversation until Jonathan puts his foot in it. She puts her tongue in it. Well, she puts her tongue in it. She eats with okay. her tongue hanging out her mouth. Yeah, let's okay. Let's take a step back before we get to Jonathan's foot. Um, I liked Jonathan describing how or telling how people, uh, locals, considered him a, a recluse. Even though he's always being seen in places. I like that. That was <laughs> yeah. very good. There's that recluse again. <laughs> and yeah, she slurps up a bit of pasta with her tongue which I think the camera tries because I'm assuming that she doesn't have a massively long tongue in real life but it's meant to look I don't know, she can apparently lick the bottom of a tube of Pringles <laughs> this is actually a wee bit of trivia about this scene um, the tongue thing is based on a, a real life event David Rennick was in America getting this American spin off of the One Foot in the Grave with Bill Cosby set up oh. and we don't want to talk about Cosby and long tongues. No, nope, in any sort of inappropriate touching of any kind. But yeah. he he would uh, he would be right up for the nudity. There was apparently somebody that Rennet was introduced to who ate in this way, mm -hmm. which he then put in this story. It seems quite cruel, but there you go. That's not cruel. He didn't name them. He didn't name them. He did say it was a cellist, though. Okay, let's search Google now for long tongued cellist from Liverpool. No, that's a different song. <laughs> Anyway, back to Jonathan's foot. What happens? He inserts it into his own mouth. How? Because um, he criticises aggressively without much cause um, Radner's brothers who died in the line of duty. Yeah, he asks her how she became a cop and I think she said her father was a cop and both her brothers were cops. And What was the remark? Yeah, her brother strong-armed her into it and he says those bastards or something along those lines, yeah. which is obviously meant to be a throwaway joke, but doesn't land because they were killed on duty. Yes, and I thought that she was making a joke. You know, I thought she was going to say, I am only joking, it's not, uh, yeah. they weren't, but, but no. No, she's serious. There's a stony silence and the mood changed. She, she doesn't seem like the sort to have a sense of humour, this character. She never displays one anyway throughout the episode. No, she's very stern. She was played by Nicola Walker, born in 1970. She has been in Four Weddings and a Funeral. Perhaps you've seen her there. I don't think I've seen that movie, but Spook. I recognise her face from something. Spooks. Never saw it. Unforgotten. Don't think so. I mean. Last Tango in Halifax. No, nope, didn't watch that. River. No. Nope. Scott and Bailey. No. Touching Evil. I don't think so. Chalk. See, this is the one... I might have watched this because I recognise some of the other people from it, but I don't remember it. I mean, she's been that many things, often playing a cop. Yeah, but I remember her from the 90s, if that makes sense. Yeah. I've got this vivid memory that her face is very familiar. Mm -hmm. I guess it must have been chalk. It's the only thing I can think of. Sure. She's a Cambridge Footlights alumni. And that'll be why she's continuing to work. She's clearly talented. Back at the Tippet House. Maddie is sat in a room full of nudists, having tea with very strategically placed cutlery. 
Well, for some of them it's strategically placed. Some of the others are just left with nothing to the imagination. Yeah, I'd prefer the, my, my imagination to be used there, to be honest. A small teaspoon. <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> A ladle. <laughs> A giant aubergine. <laughs> Maddie looks desperately uncomfortable in this environment. Like she doesn't know where to put her eyes. Yeah, you would, don't you? I mean, what, what would yeah, you do? I think you would find a point in the wall. Yeah, you would just stare at the point. It's like a photographer, and then what if you caught a reflection? Though they think you're looking at the reflection. Yeah, but I really, I, was, I think I'd just leave. I'd say, sorry, didn't realise this is what the situation was. Uh, it's, it's not for me. I'm off. Yes. Yeah. What's going to hurt their feelings more, that or when you start gawping at them? <laughs> Over at the police station, there's an angry Chinese man who's been arrested. Yeah, they're charging him with uh, murder. Speed is. Why? It's, it's not even been mentioned. I think he's the suicide bomber. But clearly his plan hasn't worked. But clearly they have no evidence of this because no. he wasn't. I think, yeah, they, they want to shake them down, perhaps. Back to the mother red cap. It's night time now. Maddie and Jonathan arrive by car with him moaning about Radnor's tongue. Now, this is you know the second time I've heard Jonathan complain about other uh, females who are interested in their, their bodies. Yeah. So we had the, the baldness before. Now yeah. we've got a tongue. It's not... A... I think it's more the way she used it to eat. To like... Yeah. He didn't like the sort of lapping up of the meal. Maddie is not sympathetic considering what she had to look at. Yeah, I think she's maybe won this one. <laughs> she does, however, have the history of the place as requested and they enter... Although she's not sure what they're looking for. No, but she's going to go through some of these deaths. She's got, I think, some paperwork and some photographs and so on. And the first one she talks about is a Gordon Chapman, a merchant banker, found dead on the floor with no sign of intervention. I think we it was mentioned earlier, we didn't talk about it. I think four of the seven were found dead and three were witnessed. Okay. One of the ones that was not witnessed was Michael Pritchett QC. And there's a photograph of him. Hmm. After looking at one of the photographs of a death scene, Jonathan apparently has worked out something and it involves Ambergast, the landlord, who we mentioned before. What are you spotted? Shoes. Over by the chest of drawers. So? The last guy you said, Chapman, had just come out of the bath and all of them were getting ready for bed. So it's a fair bet that when they died, each one of them would have been... Yes. Clever. I'll give him that. It wouldn't have worked every time, but... H hang on, who are we talking about? Ambergast? You think deliberately lured people up here to bump them off? And the amazing thing is no one tumbled it. Because there's nothing to suggest the crime had been committed. They all swallowed that tosh about dying of fright. Bearing in mind, three of them were actually seen convulsing with horror, supposedly, as they looked out. Doesn't that point you in a very definite direction? Especially when you look at all the things it couldn't have been. What was that Sherlock Holmes said to Watson? Get your kids off and give us a kiss. Exactly. Which leaves us with only one possibility. Which is? Why do you think there's no evidence of any woodworm in this skirting board when the floor here is riddled with it? Pass. Stay right where you are. What are you looking for now? I don't know till I've found it. Jonathan keeps looking around and in the next sort of it's not the next room, but there's a sort of alcove off the room where he finds... Yeah, built-in wardrobe type. Yeah, I wasn't sure if it was a toilet or a wardrobe or whatever it was. But he finds under the floorboard some sort of mechanism, which he activates. Yes, now as he is messing around with this, Maddie is frightened by an approaching rat, which she manages to hit with her boot that she removes. Yeah, now some folk might think it's a bit of a contrivance for Maddie to take her shoe off just when it would be the, the worst possible think, thing. Yeah, I think, bef yeah, talk about contrivances, even, be even before that she had removed her boots because I think she had sore feet. Yeah. Now, I've not hung around derelict buildings since I was a, a kid, but places where bodies have been found, I'm not taking my shoes off. I don't care no. if I've got slightly sore feet. Not I'm not sitting on the floor either. Not sitting on the floor giving myself a massage, a foot massage my, my shoes off in a place like that. Because you want to be able to run at any point for yes. a start. Yeah, it, it's all a little bit... I mean, suppose you could say Jonathan mentioning the feet and the shoes previously, maybe just put a bit of a subconscious tick in her mind that led to her taking her shoes off. That might lead to her thinking she'd like to, but I yeah, still think you, you wouldn't, wouldn't do it. Jonathan fortunately spots the shoe 
and runs through and saves her life from his own actions. How does he do this? He dives through the door and knocks her onto the bed. Yeah. Now, why did he save her, her life? Well, because he's activated this contraption that Amber Gas had set up to kill the men. Jonathan goes on to demonstrate what happened. And we see this, a real live demonstration, or a real dead demonstration yeah, involving... Yeah, it's a planned demonstration, it no, just kind of goes off this way. What happens? The the rat comes back, or a rat comes back, and it um, somewhat unfortunately makes its way onto what is a loaded board with metal spikes barely popping through, or metal studs of some kind barely popping through the, the surface, and as soon as it touches those, it explodes. Mm -hmm. It's like an exploding rat. Maddie wants to know how this is relevant to their current case. I want to know how come the rat deflated when it was killed. <laughs> this is just the most bizarre thing I've ever seen. Yeah, and I also want to know why Maddie considers it to be their current case. The cops have pulled Jonathan in. Yeah. Maddie's not involved. She's she's investigating Mother Redcar, so that's her, her case. The one with um, Sweetbread or whatever his name is is not mm. her case at all. No. Back to the windmill. Jonathan takes a sip of water during the night when he's in bed and he notices how viewing something through a water-filled glass can have an effect on what he sees and this is his eureka moment. Well, yes, but that seems like a red herring to me. All it shows is that he had a glass of water and he moved it during the night. Yes, but in addition to that, it shows how uh, time could go back. Could be perceived to have, yeah, but that wasn't a clue to anything. There was nothing connected. Okay, she says she saw two different times, but mm -hmm. nothing led from that. No one said, "Oh well, this death must have happened at a certain time because she saw a certain." You know, it was just okay. That explains that. That's yeah, but yeah, sure. But I think the time uh, factor element added to the overall confusion and the mystery. Mystery. So you're saying, okay, now we've ruled that out, so we can. There's not something weird going on here. Yeah, uh, that's an explanation. It starts to clear things up. It starts to yeah, you can get rid of the things that aren't relevant. But this yeah, is one of them. Yes, we now know this isn't relevant, so let's move on yeah, to well, what's yeah. Important. That's what I'm, when I say red herring. That's what I mean. It's not a clue to the murder, but it maybe helps clear the path to the the solution. The solution. Back to the police station. Gwyneth is brought in by Speed to attempt to identify the occupants of three cells. I'm not sure this is how an ID parade is supposed to be handled. No, we don't have a witness of a, a, a witness identifying highly dangerous criminals just peek through. Yeah. She's able to identify at the third attempt that she was followed home by one of these men. Again, this has not been mentioned before. It doesn't get mentioned again. Yeah, a little bit tacked on, it feels. Maybe they, I mean, this plus the scene where they arrested one of the men just seems to be padding I mm. guess it's not really relevant in any case Speed brings her to the canteen to meet with Jonathan and Maddie Gwyneth Sweetland was played by Georgina Anderson born in 1928 has been in New Tricks, Doctor Who Whitechapel, Casualty Hobie City, Heartbeat Century Falls, A Family at War and Cousin Phyllis, I think she's a fairly lengthy character actress career yeah so what does jonathan do what does he explain to D down in the canteen yeah he's got his theory about the clock mm -hmm. and mm. about the murder and the water that's the first thing he does he explains okay. how with the aid of a glass of water the time appeared to go backwards yes the time that she first saw is a mirror image or a refracted image of a different time altogether which is very easily figured out yeah so she assumes that the clock had nothing to do with the murder but speed claims it may have had everything to do with it yeah i think he he also has heard already what jonathan is going to say and he's obviously too excited to let him tell the story in his own time jonathan goes on to explain cousin to the quick we face two questions how was your husband stabbed by an assailant who appeared to spirit himself into the bedroom like dracula and then out again and what the hell had an old bag lady, whose fingernail was found on the carpet, got to do with the murder of a High Court judge? According to the description in this report, Mr. Sweetland put up no resistance to the blade or rapier or whatever it was when he was stabbed, suggesting the attack took place when he was asleep. But then how do we explain the apparent struggle? 
and the way he'd knocked all that stuff off his table. So let's run for a minute with a different hypothesis. That he was stabbed through the heart after he'd been murdered. And now we're looking for a different cause of death entirely. Something a bit less obvious that would be totally overlooked next to a knife wound in the chest. Enter Mr. William Ambergast, a thoroughly unpleasant character in the 1940s who electrocuted his victims at a London pub called the Mother Red Cap. Electrocuted? I'd been lying there trying to squeeze the mechanics of it out of my brain. How do you put an electric current through someone in such a way that no one would ever realize what had happened? You'd need to rig something up in his bedroom, something you knew he was gonna to touch that was connected to a power point that looked entirely harmless. You would think he might have got the pathologist to look into whether there was any evidence of electrocution. Yeah. Or the police might have. No, no, Jonathan, he doesn't care, he's just come up with a theory, but you can't just say, oh, it might have happened this way, therefore it did happen this way. Yeah, that's a good point. It goes on to offer a solution via flashback that involves rigging up the alarm clock to kill the judge. And this explains how and why the table and its contents were knocked over. Yeah, they electrocuted the snooze button, or the alarm button. Now, Jonathan's holding the clock. If this is evidence, why did they let him hold the clock? By this point, they would have uh, forensics would have taken from it what they need. Uh, anyway, there is a more sinister twist as Jonathan continues. Yes, he points out there's only one possible killer, and I think the the implication is it was Mrs. Sweetland. But no, no, the first person to reach the body was WPC Radner, and everyone in the canteen turns to look at her, and she knows the game is up. Yeah, they've got newspaper clippings to prove it was her. <laughs> yeah, she's so, <laughs> but she shows no sign of remorse. No, she's not at all upset about this. The judge had um, let out on bail a man who went on to kill both of her brothers while they were in, on duty. And she blamed the judge for this. Understandably, if irrationally. And didn't care what happened to her. Yeah, Maddie understands her anger but can't accept it gave her the right to kill. And through some flashbacks, Radner then admits the act and describes what happened. So firstly, she was lucky to be put on the protection duty of the judge himself. Now, surely everyone would have known about that. Yes. If your brothers are killed, you know, everyone in the force says, oh, that's a uh, fair Radner, do you know, they talk about you behind your back, do you know, her brothers were killed. He let the man out on bail. Yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. It was a very high profile. And her connection to the judge would have been... Yeah, everyone would have known about that. Still, that's not the worst contrivance here. The fact that she happened to be at Mother Red Cap. Yes, where she found the old lady. Who turned out to be the young prostitute from the killings. Yeah. Um, who told her the whole story. And... Yeah, but yeah, basically she had elaborated on the story of the Ambergast killings. The woman mm -hmm. who was with the men was always the same and she was involved in the, the killings. And this was her. So we don't have to feel bad for her dying anymore. She was involved in the murder of seven men. Yeah, she was scumbag, old, trampy old, bag, just an old bag lady. She died in that room where she deserved to. Yep, I'm glad she's dead. Yeah, I don't, I just don't care. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It, yeah, it turned out that the men's wives were paying to have them knocked off. Correct. And this led to her plan that she was able to implement with the help of the tongs. Yes, because obviously the tongs maybe couldn't get at the judge themselves. Now, the time scale on this is quite tricky because the news report suggested that this threat had come out that day and the armed guard was that night. When was she allocated to this position? When did they know he needed protection? Mm. Was he protected during an earlier part of the proceedings? I yeah, know. perhaps. Yeah. The start of the episode made it seem like this was a one-off thing. This is something that's just happened and he needs this protection tonight specifically. No. You think it wasn't? You think it's a longer term project? Well, definitely. I think the, was it the, uh, the trial or not the next day? I thought it was after the trial. I thought he'd convicted this gang and that was why he'd been threatened. No. You don't think so? No, I think well, the trial... You, well, I think the trial... if it would be to knock off a judge before the trial? This is appoint another judge. 
Yeah, but then it's just a revenge killing, isn't it? And these professional gangs don't tend to do that. They only they kill for a reason. They, under, they accept that judges are going to. I mean, they don't. The mafia types and these gangs don't give about killing every cop and judge because you know that's their job. Yeah. In any event, somehow the Chinese. She went to the Chinese, in their gang of, as a police officer, was allowed into their sort of illegal uh, room of evil plans. Although in fairness, I think if you go to them and you say, here's my newspaper clippings, you see my brothers were kill killed by, and you explain they might be more understanding. Yeah, but they might also say, hello, Mrs. Policewoman, I do not want to kill anybody. What are you talking yeah. about? Are you an undercover cop? <laughs> no, I'm an overcover <laughs> cop. No. Yeah, you wouldn't take the risk, would you? You'd just say, yeah. nah, you're a cop. I'm not going to get involved in any killing. Yeah. I'm not going to admit to killing a judge. Yeah, get involved in that. <laughs> but, but they helped her with this clock and said it could be swapped back in for the original, but that doesn't seem to have happened. Yeah, I think they've got uh, expertise in electronics. Clearly, this is one of these sort of resourceful gangs that have skills of all sorts. Mm -hmm. They give her a stabby thing because mm -hmm. all Chinese villains have a stabby thing on of their course. wrists. Yeah, and she used it to stab Sweetland after he was electrocuted, so that nobody would look to the clock. But then forgot to swap it back for the one that wasn't electrocuted. Hmm. Mm. But then she doesn't care. She's not upset about this. She doesn't feel bad that she's been caught in this infuriates Mrs. Sweetland who goes for her. Yeah. Okay. Before we get to that, we find out how the nail got there as well. When she was speaking to the bag lady, she picked up the nail or she helped her unsnag it. Yeah. And it, it obviously fell from her when she ran into the room. Yeah, but why would you, you, why pull, was she cutting it you pull off a tramp's nail? Uh. You just drop it in the floor. It's not like it was... <laughs> why'd you keep it? I don't know. I don't know. It's a weird one. Maybe it's a sort of Reminder to her of, you know, see this plan through. That was when she was inspired to carry this out. I think it's just a contrivance again. Yeah, it's, 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 and it didn't really help them solve the case at all. No. But yes, yeah, so Mrs. Sweetland is furious, flies for Radnor, and when Speed tries to intervene, he is killed. Yeah, as he uh, falls down during the scuffle, it doesn't look good. Do we think heart attack or did he hit his head? What was the... I don't know. He did talk about his high stress levels. I think it's stress, yeah. yeah. I think it's heart attack. I, I think... You wouldn't assume in this type of show that he would die. You'd expect to see him in the next scene. He's okay. propped up in bed in the hospital with Jonathan yeah. you know, and Maddie with a bunch of grapes. But no. Uh, no, we're back to the windmill and it's later that night that we see on TV that Speed has died and is being given the credit for solving the case. Yeah, Maddie's quite pleased that Jonathan's done this. Yeah, I mean, he doesn't care about the limelight and I think she mentions that it was... Uh, it's nice for the widow, Speed, yeah. who... You know, it gives her something to hang on to. And it, it helps Jonathan make up for being an anally retentive smart arse who never gets anything wrong. <laughs> now, I was quite disappointed the first time with this death because I think that uh, a semi-recurring character with the speed would have been... You know, I think yeah. I, I, could have, I could have put up with him a, a, for a few episodes now and again. Maybe. I mean, he had his... Yeah, certainly he was more memorable than the other mm. police officers we've seen. You see, you see I think, I, I, you know, like, uh, like Holmes, when, when you're a magician's assistant... Cop shows don't need it. Columbo never needed it because Columbo is uh, as his job to investigate murders. Yeah. But sometimes, if you're you know if you're a, a magician's assistant, you need a you need access to a, a crime scene to be involved, a, a reason to be involved in yeah. solving murders. And I think you know a a relationship with a, a cop. Yeah, like know, Sherlock Holmes has. Yeah. But, but yeah, but Sherlock Holmes with uh, Lestrade uh, is a you know it's, it offers a solution to that problem. But like we mentioned before, uh, David Rennick had it in for the actor and has killed him off and everything they've worked together on. <laughs> Jonathan's made a Caesar salad for Maddie who eats it with her tongue hanging out to upset him. Yes. And pretends to hate it. She does. And I think she says, uh, I'll go and get ready, we'll go up and we'll grab a chippy. This is the most repulsive, disgusting salad I've ever had the misfortune to eat in my entire life. And what happens when he nips up to put his jacket on? She scoffs a bit more of the delicious salad. Yeah, because he's uh, obviously a very good cook. I don't, I don't know if you call it cooking to put a salad together. Yeah, I didn't say you were cooking, but if you're a cook. Okay, fair enough. And that's the episode finished, but I forgot to mention, I should have done a moment ago, Hilary Sesta played the, the bag lady. She died in 2013, aged 82. She has been in The Bill, My Hero, Last of the Summer Wine, Cadfell, Jeeves and Wooster, 1983's Doctor Who and Jabberwocky decent list of things mm -hmm. okay well that's the end of the season yes can I slip back in my little bit of trivia from earlier on you're desperate for this really it's just I've written it down now I should say it 
it's it better be good. Oh, it's not that You've good. You've been building went, this up, right from the all start. all the trouble of writing it down. Go on, Nanine. Impresses. Mother Redcap. Mm-hmm. Uh, David Rennick came up with the title before he had a story to go with it. It was a pub that he frequented in the early 70s. Um, and his titles tend, or he thinks, tend to echo Poe or Holmes or be a silly play on words. But this is one that was unique in that respect. Mm-hmm. Go on, continue with it. That's the entire story. Really? Yes. So you're not going to tell us about Mother Redcap being a name for women who brewed ale in pubs or sometimes relating to mysterious witchery. No, uh, sometimes, uh, some, specifically sometimes Ginny Bingham, who was perceived to be a witch and haunted the underworld pub in Camden hundreds of years ago. No, but that's quite a good story. I like the creepy sign that they had for the one in this episode. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Good for atmosphere. Certainly. Okay. We've got an episode review to do and also the season review we do we'll do the episode review first why not fairly easy this week motive revenge the clues i'll rattle through tell me what i miss the ripped nail the bag lady herself the unexplained deaths the clock the method of murder at mother red cat anything else the lack of struggle in the wound but the fact that the table had been dislodged during the death sure gotcha newspaper clippings and also access to the body and the time of death i suppose I mean, yeah. once they establish it was six o'clock then the only folk in, in the room yes yeah and uh, yeah as you say the new, the newspapers uh, provide the motivation that's it what we'll do now is we will go through the previous episodes in this season and we will try to work out what well in the Colombo podcast, I think even in season one of this one, we looked at the crime and the criminal and whether they would be imprisoned or whatever on the basis of what we saw. But not every episode in this season has that sort of no. story to, to resolve. No, it's an odd one. Let's give it a bash. Dance Macabre. Okay, so you had the husband and the daughter putting the women out of her misery, essentially, and trying to claim the insurance money. I think what would happen is they would not get the insurance money and they mm-hmm. would be convicted of a crime, maybe not murder, but possibly murder. Well, I've been not guilty here. I don't think there's any proof other than the confession. I suppose, yes, we should specify that we're discounting confessions. Yes, we're assuming that they, uh, they take back any confessions that, that may have uh, provided in the episode. So we've got a good, a reasonable, a competent defence lawyer. Yep. And they're, they're now saying, yep, nope, didn't do it. Didn't murder anyone. Go and prove it. Yeah, yeah. go and prove it. And also you've got a viable alternate suspect in this one. Yeah. Well, Who stole the head of the, the corpse. The man with the head in, the, in his in, in the aeroplane, yeah. I, yeah, I'm going with him not guilty. Especially if you can find that, uh, if, if he gets caught with a, walking, <laughs> walking through the airport with a head. Yeah, it's possible that they would get off scot-free on this occasion. Time waits for Norman. Well, there's not really much of a crime going on here, but... Yeah, he might lose his marriage or his other relationship. I should hope he would. But she didn't seem that keen to be getting rid of him straight away. Well, his only crime was trying to love. No, that wasn't his only crime. <laughs> it's like fraud. Fraud was his only crime. <laughs> it's like these Hollywood stars, isn't it? Where they get caught cheating and they're suddenly they're sex addicts. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, no, you're not. It's a lie. Yeah, total lie. But I'm, it's a, it's a, I can't help it. A condition yeah. yeah, Michael Douglas. Yeah, you're not a you're not a sex addict. You just like it. We talk about fraud though. Is it him that committed the fraud, or is it his partner who was pretending to be him? I think he's an accomplice to yeah. fraud, but art and part. Perhaps. Yeah, I, mean, I think really in, in this case, it's, it's not applicable. I don't yeah. think there's any uh, criminal proceeding going to take place. Okay. Scented room. Is there a crime here? Yes, there was a crime, but again, I don't. It won't go to court. Uh, there's no. I can't see the. The, the crown office pursuing this well they found the picture and it wasn't in the door which is on the floor mm-hmm. the kid had it yeah i mean we discussed i don't think it was on mike but you know the definition of theft i think it's depriving someone of something so if i hide something in your house if i take your phone and hide it so you can't find it yeah you can't use it i can't use the excuse oh well i didn't steal it well i deprived you of it so yeah i think that's uh it's possible, yes, that there's a crime here, but there's not enough evidence to convict anybody of having committed it. Mm-hmm. They can't even prove the girl was in the room. There's no witnesses. The witnesses say it was empty. No, there's nothing here. This isn't yeah. nothing. Not applicable again. Hell's Gate. There's a number of crimes here. Yes, but 
I'm going not guilty. I don't think, again, there was any evidence if it goes to court. Yeah, Maddie says, oh, how could she have known about this? She doesn't have to give evidence, she doesn't have to speak to whether yeah, she knew about this. Yeah, Maddie lied about the um, fingerprints from the massage on Jonathan's neck. Yep, so that's not evidence. And there's no, no. tape with the message and so on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think, what about Duncan, though? Would he be convicted of it? Of murder? Mm-hmm. His fingerprints are all over the place. He deliberately... Um, lied to him or faked his own day. Yeah, he built him. <laughs> he had one of the entry machine tapes in his property. He's also yeah. been in that house. He went to the lengths of building a <laughs> massive hole in, net in, in his driving. Car. Jumped from it. He had to look. at Yeah, I think he might. Uh, I think there might be a, a miscarriage of justice, or maybe just uh, the, a different know, form of justice. justice. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, he might be convicted. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, don't like him. <laughs> Mother Redcap, the WPC didn't really confess so much as confirm but I still think uh, with all the evidence the, the amount of it the volume of it the, the, the motive the opportunity yeah I think means. she's in dire straits if she wants to get away with this one yeah I'm going guilty on this one okay do you agree? yeah no I think she would go to prison next time we've got Black Canary the 1998 Christmas special is it? yes okay so I think that's a, a longer one 90 minutes Oof. okay so that was it yeah we'll be back in a couple of weeks until then cheerio bye bye